Hi, everybody. How's it going? It's almost over. I know, I know. I know you've heard this a lot over the past couple days, but uh, I just want to acknowledge how nice it is to be all in the same room together again. Um, of course, there's no guarantee that things might stay like this, but I mean, look at us. We're all here. This is great, right? Come on. We're because we're physically here in the same space, I can do things I couldn't do at home. Like I can do, I can do this. Well, I guess, uh, I guess I probably could have just done that at home. Um, but I can do this. Come on, give it to me. Woo! Woo! <laughs> For those of you that I haven't met, my name is John Kropezzi, and I am a longtime Ruby developer. And I'd love to tell you more about myself, but I needed to cut some content from this talk. And I'm just so excited about the work I'm going to show you today that it didn't feel right to cut anything else. So if you want to get to know me, you can find me after the talk, or you can find me on Twitter. Uh, in reflection right now, this kind of looks like I died, but <laughs> it is what it is. I've been working at GitHub for the past five years, and for most of that time, I've been working very closely with our large monolithic uh, Rails application, which we call github.com slash github slash github. <laughs> Affectionately, internally, we call it GitHub GitHub. Uh, and we've had multiple large Slack conversations about what does that mean? Is, is it the monolith? Is it the website? Uh, but in the end, is it going to change? No. It's been covered a lot in our talks by developers over the years, but GitHub's monolithic Rails application is definitely operating at or near the largest scaled Rails applications of all time. Uh, the scaled in ter terms of traffic, for sure, but also in terms of size, likely also number of contributors. After 14 years, we've racked up 400 models, uh, many regular active developers, and we even presently shard our data across uh, 17 separate database clusters, each of which we also run replicas for. I joined Eileen in her keynote last year, which was great. Did everyone see the keynote? Yeah. We did this great green screen execution, and we talked about changes that we had upstream to support granular sharding uh, and role swapping in RELs. The database connection management work that we talked about last year is just part of a never-ending series of threads that we're pulling on to expand the boundaries of Rails as a framework and make sure that we can continue to build on it because it's so core to what we're building at GitHub. In this talk, I'll be going through a few other threads that I've been pulling on, in particular some things that we've noticed as our application continues to scale, things, mind you, that are present in pretty much every ORM that implements the active record pattern. Uh, and some experiments that I've been developing on top of Active Record, the framework, and library to tinker with ways to solve these pain points. Probably up front here, it's worth covering the distinction that I just tried to make with my, my emphasis, which is that Active Record, the pattern, is different from Active Record, the library. Active Record, the Rails ORM that we kind of know and love, is a Ruby implementation of a design pattern which was outlined in this book, uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture by Mountain, Martin Fowler. Uh, I keep trying to get my kids to read this, but they haven't. <laughs> active Record's not the most creative name for a library implementing the Active Record pattern, uh, I'll admit, but it seems to be pretty par for the course. Martin, in that book, also talks about the Data Mapper pattern, which was implemented in the popular Ruby ORM, Data Mapper. So what do we mean when we talk about the Active Record pattern? The pattern at its core is the idea that you can take a class, which represents a table in a database, and you can interact with individual instances of that class, which each represent a row from the owning table. By interacting with those models, we largely don't have to worry about the underlying SQL, and we can execute database calls. In Rails's implementation of Active Record, these classes are defined and owned as part of your application code. So the methods that you're defining on your models, they live right alongside the methods that are automatically created by the framework for dealing with the database. When I create a new user, I can access the implicitly created login or name methods, or I can access my own methods, in this case, display name, which are defined right alongside them. And this is really powerful, really good. It's powerful for a few ideas. Uh, the first is that the ORM pattern takes something that's really familiar to us, the idea of classes and instances, and it lets us reason about databases in the same way. And while I definitely still think developers should have to know SQL to kind of know the performance implications, it is 100% reasonable with Active Record to not write even a single line of SQL and implement an application. Next, there's less moving pieces in Active Record. We've combined essentially the data layer and our application code into one. So there's less surface area, there's less files, there's less interactions between different parts of our app that we need to write tests for. And lastly, we don't have to write a bunch of repetitive code to do the things that most applications still want to do. By inheriting from Active Record Base, we just get a ton of functionality for free. 
On the other hand, there are some drawbacks to this. First, not all the concepts that we want to represent in our application strictly map to a single table. We often end up testing with our database in place uh, because our application and our data layers are so tightly coupled. Next, our objects unintentionally expose a bunch of extra surface area. We only test the methods that we expect to get used, but what about all those other methods that are sitting there that were defined by active record? What's to tell future developers on your application that those methods shouldn't be used? And how does that scale when you add more developers? And lastly, it's just really easy to write inefficient code, particularly with regard to relations and column overfetching, both of which I'll cover in a minute. If you notice that a lot of the drawbacks that I just described are kind of the inverse of the pros, that's definitely like not an accident. Uh, it kind of highlights that most of the decisions that we have to make as software developers are about trade-offs. Most of the time, something like terseness kind of begets ambiguity. Things like normalization can beget cold sprawl. Um, what you're feeling that feels good when you use Rails, and a lot of the reason that most of us are in the room right now, is, the, is a set of decisions that lean into the expressiveness of Ruby and an expectation that most of the apps built on Rails will have the same general structure to tip the scales on some of these decisions in favor of more, more compact code without losing readability. Ideally, we want to stick with that theme when we're introducing new, more advanced ways to interact with our databases that we can give more control to developers without feeling more controlling or more constraining. It's okay to acknowledge that active record as a pattern and as a framework is tightly coupled because that's a design choice that was made by the library and by the pattern. And with that lens, I've been looking at two problems that we've been encountering more and more uh, at GitHub with active record, and those are batch loading and code ownership in applications shared by many teams. So let's just jump right in. We'll start with batch loading. In web applications, something that comes up pretty often as a pattern is fetching and iterating over some collection and then doing something with each of the records. Uh, in Rails applications, this is normally done in the views, and it looks something like this. Uh, and this is all well and good as long as the method that we're calling is cheap to call. Like in this case, we're calling title, and title is cheap to call because it's already been loaded into memory by the call that got all of the posts. There's one query here for all the posts. Sometimes, though, the things we're doing inside the methods aren't cheap. Uh, we may be do so, doing something with the records, uh, like loading in another association inside of each iteration. And we call this type of anti-pattern an n plus 1. It's an n plus 1 because there's one query for the base set of records at the top, and then there's n queries, one for each of the things that we need to load, in this case, the comments for. And due to the way that the active record pattern lays things out, it's pretty easy to introduce these n plus 1s in your application if you're not intentionally looking out for them. Most methods, like I said, are defined on the instance. So kind of the default behavior, if you don't do anything, is that you will introduce an n plus 1. That's how it works. That's how the pattern is built. Typically, the answer to solve this is to use something like includes to prefill associations for all of the given records. So with includes, all you would do is call includes, and you would pass a symbol representing the association that you need to load. And then in the view, you have uh, no more n plus 1. This instead now will just execute two queries, one for the base collection, get all the posts, and then one for all of the associations, which then get split up to the individual records, and everything's good. And this is a really neat feature of Rails. Uh, without active record handling this for us, it would be quite a mess. This is an example of implementing includes without having the use of includes. And it gets even more complicated when you consider that includes calls can actually contain nested associations. So to write this code without using includes would just be a nightmare. One thing that's really cool about includes, too, that we probably don't give enough thought to when we're using it, is that it keeps the developer from having to maintain two separate implementations for batch and non-batch uses. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that real quick. A lot of times we have data that we need to use in multiple contexts. So in the case of a comment count, we might want to include that on the list of posts. And then when you go to the display page, we also want to have the comment count there. Uh, includes lets us write one implementation and just transparently handles the batch loading details under the hood. In other words, we write the single version, and then we just get the batch version for free as long as we stick to Rails conventions. So includes, really good. A few questions come to mind when you start to use it, though. So how do we know if we're missing it includes? Has anyone ever seen anything like this in their application logs? Right? Yep. Uh, by default, the answer is that for missing includes, we're depending on developer kind of diligence. I, I think a lot of times we, we see these uh, in a query log. They, they, they go by, and this is how we catch missing includes. Uh, a lot of times we put effort into removing n plus ones from our hot paths, but we don't pay nearly enough attention to the other actions around our application. 
There are actually solutions to this. So one is a gem called Bullet, uh, which can help by detecting n plus ones in dev and test. Who's used Bullet? Just raise your hands. Nice. It's a lot. Also, uh, last year, I think Eileen and Aaron uh, in Rails 6.1 introduced a feature called uh, strict mode or strict loading. And what it is is a way to prevent people from mistakenly loading more associations than they expected to by essentially just saying, within this block, with this object, just refuse to load associations. You should definitely check it out. It's a great feature. Next, what happens if you have an extra includes? Uh, well, if you have an extra includes, it turns out the data still gets loaded. Uh, and this can be really hard to keep the two things in sync and prevent overfetching, which is one of these other ergonomic issues with includes. Consider, especially the times uh, with includes, the things that need to be loaded up front don't actually correspond to the name of the association that you need to make it performant. There are no clear ways currently to discover or remove includes that aren't needed, and that leads to a bunch of overfetching in our applications. So you kind of have this choice of like, am I gonna make it efficient by adding includes, and then I, I risk maybe doing too much work uh, because I'm not using the includes. What if the thing I'm loading isn't a just a direct association, but maybe it has extra conditions on it? What if the thing I'm loading is a count, and that is gonna be an M plus one too? There are solutions for a couple of these things, but what if the thing that I'm loading is calling an external service? It's not even related to the database. Then includes can't help us anymore. And then there's the final question of where do you put the includes? Okay, you wanna use includes. Uh, you need to put it somewhere and you need to be able to keep it in, in sync with the rest of the code, there are kind of two approaches to doing this. The first one is to put it in the view. Uh, this seems tempting, and it puts the includes next to the method that's being called. So you can try to keep them in sync just due to like proximity. They're next to each other. If I put something in the loop, I can just update the includes. But a lot of times in our views, we use partials, and then things start to fall apart there. All of a sudden, you have the includes being called at a different place than the thing that potentially is going to add more things that need to be loaded. These are bound to diverge. The other option, aside from the view, is to put it inside the controller. Uh, and this is the most standard approach. I think a lot of people probably use this approach. Uh, but you've got a few other problems when you do this. First, keeping the controller in sync with every change in a view has the same problem that we described with the partials. Uh, and second, yes, sure, when I add a method to an iteration, I can say, I'll just go add the uh, appropriate includes, but what do I do when I want to remove the use of a method? Now I have to figure out not only which includes corresponds to the method that I removed, but also whether or not that includes is actually used in multiple places for multiple methods. And lastly, what do you do about things like conditional access? If something's used only conditionally, say to show things only to admin users, how do you split off the concerns from the main includes cleanly? In this case, I have to have two separate includes, and not only that, I also have to have the same logic mirrored in my view. Clearly, while a great tool includes has some issues that make it really hard for developers to use and maintain the use of consistently. Okay, but then it got even worse. <laughs> Around the time that GraphQL was starting to come into use, these problems really started to boil over for us at GitHub. We were making a GraphQL API, and for the reasons that I just mentioned, it's hard enough to maintain includes when in a normal application, but how do you safely preload data for a query that's coming in that's arbitrarily nested? You have to fix the N plus ones here, because if you don't, you're exposing your application to some type of denial of service or very slow requests. Uh, and you can't just write in includes, because the includes actually needs to be dynamic based on the fields that are being requested. So Shopify, thank you, came up with a neat library uh, for batch loading, which is called GraphQL Batch. Uh, and you can read more about it on the Shopify blog. It's at the bottom here. Uh, and when you use GraphQL Batch, you define these things called loaders. Here's an example of a, a loader here, which is taken from the readme. Uh, what, the, what you do is you define a perform method and then inside of it you have to call fulfill for each of the IDs that had been passed in. So you're essentially creating a mapping between the things that were requested and the things that are going out. But then, in some stroke of genius or stroke of something, uh, someone at GitHub, and I, and I legitimately mean I think this is very cool, um, someone at GitHub when they were implementing the GraphQL batch uh, implementation that we use internally, changed how the perform method works. And they decided that they didn't like how this fulfill thing worked, and instead they, they said that all perform methods should be implemented in terms of this signature. So this is an array of IDs to a hash of ID to value, okay? And this signature is really important, and it, it, it's important because it kind of wraps up the generic idea of what is a batch method. Uh, let me explain that because I think that might not be clear. Uh, the collection of things that I want to load some data for goes in, 
in this case the ID is one, two, and three. And then the batch method can be defined and thought of as a method that returns a hash of ID to value. So in this case, each of the keys in the hash on the right-hand side correspond to one of the inputs, and each of the values that correspond to that key is the, the thing that is loaded for batch. Putting that into a code perspective, just so we can see it again, uh, this is part of the implementation of the includes that I wrote earlier. And you can see in this implementation, we do the same thing. We get an array of IDs, that gets kind of, that's the input, and then the output is some operation that produces a hash of ID to value. Does this make sense for everybody? Yeah. The GraphQL batch library then goes on to define these methods which return promise instances that resolve to the individual objects, and it, it's really neat because it makes it so that you only make a database call once you need to, and you're able to put all the things you need into one call. If you use this library correctly, you can actually remove the need for developers to have to think in terms of includes, and you can successfully implement a GraphQL API, like we did at GitHub, that doesn't suffer from most types of N plus one problems. The includes are just kind of built into the implementation. You don't have to write them anymore. We're getting really close, um, but there's still a few issues. First, like I was saying earlier, we don't want to use this just in GraphQL. We want to have this, uh, this concept everywhere. Second, defining platform loaders exist in a separate file from our model. So while that's good for kind of separation of concerns, it doesn't feel very Rails-like because we're used to, like, like I said before, putting our data model and our application model in one place. And last, promises just can be a, a little awkward for Ruby developers. I think, actually, promises are pretty awkward in general, but they're definitely not part of the toolkit of, for most Ruby developers. The more I thought about it, though, the more I couldn't get the idea out of my head of that generic representation of what it means to be a batch method, the ID to, or array of IDs to hash of ID to value. I started experimenting with the same idea inside of a library that we started to use internally at GitHub, which is called Prelude. I'm gonna show you how it works briefly. Uh, so in Prelude, you define a batch method on your model. You use this uh, define Prelude method, and it uses, it's expected to conform to the same signature that we've been talking about and you get a few things out the other end. First, you can call it just like a regular method on a regular object, but the second is, in the bottom example you can see, when we call with prelude, we're actually able to make it so that when the view is asking for a certain piece of information, the first time it's requested, it goes and runs the batch method and loads it for all of them. Um, it essentially lets us, uh, you can see here there's no more includes. We've essentially tied the includes to the implementation sitting inside of the model and no more M plus one. It's pretty cool. In a way, it's kind of the inverse of includes. We here define the batch version and we get the single version for free. And similar to GraphQL batch, we can use this library to no longer need to call includes inside of our controllers. And it works for any type of association, not just database ones, but also network calls because nothing about it is specific to a database. Uh, you can check this library out if you're interested at GitHub. So far, this has been working pretty well for us, uh, with a few issues still to figure out around making sure that we don't load too much data. Um, we're still evolving. Uh, there are some other, other evolutions of this still in the works. Um, an API like this may eventually make sense to upstream into Active Record, and we'd love to hear what you think. You can reach out to me on Twitter or, or find me afterward if you're, if you're excited about this. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, and now we're just we're pivoting, second point, we're doing the other one. Uh, the other primary thread that I've personally been pulling on over the past year is one of code ownership and responsibility. So let's just jump right in. Uh, most software stacks, even the ones that claim to be like properly evolved service-oriented architectures, have pieces around their application that need to stitch together the concerns of multiple domains. So at like flippantpanda.com, there is almost certainly a flippantpanda slash flippantpanda repo um, that validates and pulls apart the user request to figure out what other systems need to be involved to serve that request. And Ruby and Rails are, is a perfect fit technology-wise for that service um, with its ability to do everything from database interactions to client-side asset bundling, background jobs. Um, it's the perfect fit for the service that has to kind of stitch things together. Um, but due to their mixed domain, these op applications often become larger, and when they become larger, they're often run by uh, multiple teams with overlapping responsibilities. Maybe you have the issues team maintaining the issues pages, and you have the profiles team working on the profiles pages. And in most applications, we just let them all mingle together like a bunch of peas and carrots crossing over into each other on a plate in a directory called app slash models. And yes, 
It's pretty frustrating to have them all in one folder, but for the most part, it's okay, because teams know which files are theirs, they know which directories are theirs, uh, and they know their own domain. Rails has a consistent structure for where to put certain types of files, so while I may be overwhelmed by the site of all these models and it might be giving me anxiety, it doesn't actually cause a problem. Plus, if you wanna fix it, there exist viable solutions to fix this problem. The first is that you can use folders or namespacing. Some people use Rails engines, probably not advisable, but it's okay. Uh, and then the most recent uh, and probably best solution is to use another library from Shopify, which is called Shopify Packwork. Does anyone use Packwork? Less, less, we'll get there. Uh, the bigger problem on apps not maintained by teams is one of API exposure. So the two questions that come to mind, and I keep doing two things, I don't know why, but the two things that come to mind are which models can talk to which, and how does team A know how to properly interact with the models that are owned by team B? Like, let's take those one at a time, because I, I I'm not sure that they're the same level of important. Um, first start with which models can talk to which. And when we say that, what we really mean is how exposed is a given model to the rest of the application. And it turns out to fix this or to, to deal with this problem, we actually can use Packwork. Well, we can kind of use Packwork. Uh, if we go to the Packwork uh, readme, we see this, this kind of warning. It says method calls and objects passed around the application are completely ignored. Packwork only cares about static constant references. Well, it's not that Packwork doesn't care, of course. Packwork cares. It's more that it's not feasible for Packwork to care. And of course, this makes sense. To get behavior that didn't operate with a restriction like this would involve a massive, pretty unacceptable performance overhead, likely a custom build of Ruby. When objects are flying around call sites and as parameters and return values, we can't restrict what type they are because Ruby's duct typed. The, the type is kind of like purposely unknown. If only Ruby weren't duct typed, then maybe we could, <laughs> we could lock down these boundaries between domains and we could only allow access to the, the uh, classes that we choose to expose to different parts of our app. Okay, the paragraph keeps going and it says, that said, if you want Packwork to analyze parameters of a method, uh, you can use Sorbet. Sorbet, who saw that coming? Everyone, right? Uh, Sorbet signatures are pure Ruby code. Well, how did you? How do you do? That's pretty neat. Uh, because, and just to explain what this means real quick, because Sorbet's type signatures are pure Ruby, when Packwork, which only looks at constant references, looks at a file, it can spot the violations that are in parameters because they will have been referenced by, by, by Sorbet uh, in pure Ruby. It's really, it's really pretty cool, actually, that they work together to think that. Um, and with this, we're actually able to do what we want. If we want to fix this problem, which like it's debatable whether or not this is a problem that needs to be fixed, you can do it. Uh, this is what Packwork was built for, and especially when combined with Sorbet, it's the thing that it does really, really well. The second question we pose, though, is how does Team A know how to interact with Team B's models? And that one is uh, quite a bit trickier. For example, if I'm not on the issues team and I need to uh, rename an issue in code, it might be tempting to just write this, issue, update, name, new name, or title, new name. In most code bases, though, and probably in your code bases, this is wrong. This is not the right way. Uh, issue updates may need to do things like notify users or create a parameterized copy of the title. Um, it's possible to do all those things in callbacks and validations, and maybe this is like one way to solve the problem, but this is really complex, and it's really hard to reason about. It's hard to look at this code and have someone tell me what happens when I change the name of an issue because it's all intermixed in different parts of my code. And for that reason, a lot of us, when we implement something like this, we do it by implementing a method called update name, update title, right? So now we have two ways to do the same thing. We have the Rails way at the top, and then we have the, the right way at the bottom. And a developer not familiar with both and not going in to see which methods exist is going to reach for a convention. Reaching for convention means they're gonna pick the first one and then they will have introduced a bug in your application. Even developers working alone or in smaller teams have these problems. When you do something like this, when you're inside of a view, instead of a, uh, using a scope, you use where, like in the first example, you are encoding details about your data model into your view. In the bottom example, you're using a scope, so you're letting the model handle those details. These problems come up pretty often. They show up as inconsistencies sometimes, and sometimes they show up as security, security incidents. So on this point, a little less of a home run. 
Active Record Intermix is the representation of the data model and the application model. With Packwork, we can control what parts of the application can interact with our models across domains. But once someone has one of those models, they also have unrestricted ability to call methods, including critically the data specific methods that are given to us by Active Record. So I started to play with a few ways to split them up, and that's what I'm going to talk about. By far the most straightforward and uh, instant idea that came to my mind was that we can enforce this split by changing what it feels, uh, feels like to use Rails, or sorry, without changing what it feels like to use Rails, is to use Ruby's method visibility to make the data methods provided by Active Record private. This makes it so other parts of your application can still use your application models, but they can't reach into the data model. Only your application methods can reach into the data model. Hopefully this graphic makes that, <laughs> makes that apparent. It turns out making these methods that, private, though, is really difficult because so many parts of our applications and so many parts of Rails internals and how the tests are written actually rely on them being public. Even things like validate, scope, and has many are technically just public methods, though we can all agree probably that it would be bad form to call these from outside of your classes. We can get an idea, though. We can get an idea of how it might work by choosing the most common methods. This is just a couple of them. And then we can actually wrap them into a, a module, which we can include, that will make, uh, make them hidden. And this works. This, this works fine. Um, and when you start to use it, you'll realize that it's actually really nice to use. It starts pointing things out in your applications that you maybe didn't realize you were intermingling concerns or depending on private data access from active record. So I converted a few apps to use this, and the things that it pointed out to me like definitively made the application better. Like the refactors that I had to do to make the app still work, definitely, definitely like a net positive. So at that point I was hooked. But it was clear that we couldn't proceed with this. Uh, this would require massive changes to active record, and even if we, even if we were able to do that, uh, we would leave all of the application authors in a state where all of their apps wouldn't work anymore because in your apps you're, you're bound to have these issues. It's not like a solution you can get to progressively. You, you have to kind of like go there all at once. So how else could we achieve a separation like this? Well, it turns out we can fall on another programming pattern. Uh, in this case, we're falling back onto, uh, uh, I, this, is the wrong, this is the wrong graphic. No! Uh, <laughs> we fall onto the idea of a, a, a proxy pattern. So the proxy exposes methods uh, that we want, and then it delegates the rest to this other hidden underlying model. So the graphic is wrong, unfortunately, but just imagine that the bottom half of this was actually a separate model. So that, that separate model, the data model, would inherit from active record base, and the top version would essentially call into it. So you would, you would be okay with the fact that active records methods were public because they're not the ones that you're actually passing around your app. It's pretty verbose, it doesn't feel like Rails because you're creating two separate models. But to make that uh, maybe idea a little simpler and to cut down on the mental overhead that comes with having to maintain those two separate models, I experimented with creating a small library which I called proxy record. You can find it at cjohnrun slash proxy record on GitHub. Uh, and the way that it works is you create a model just like normal, but instead of putting all of the things that are specific to active record directly into the model, you put them inside of a data model eval block. And what you get by doing that is you get a thing that feels uh, like active record, except any time that you're calling to the internal API, you have to call through this data model local that's given to you. Um, so this is pretty neat. I guess like one thing that's not great about it is that now you have a lot more calls to data model. Like pretty much everything you want to do is going to have to call to data model. So that's not as good as the private version. Um, and then the other dilemma is that it's just really easy to leak the objects by mistake. We have to be really careful when we're writing pretty much any method that interacts with the underlying data model or its associations. We have to make sure we're not leaking these objects, which should only be accessible to the application uh, model layer. So Packwork could be a, a good solution here, but we actually don't use uh, Sorbet at Packwork, so not perfect. And um, I wondered if there was maybe some other way to get this guarantee and lock things down. So I've been doing a lot of work recently on a library that is derived from proxy record, which I've been calling light record for just no reason at all. I don't know why. Uh, the idea is a little different. The idea is to implement a layer between active record and the application model classes. Uh, essentially, this is a layer that works just like active record, but all of the methods are private. And then they delegate over to the public version of the active record model on the right-hand side. And the benefit of that is that once we have that shim layer in place, we can actually also have the opportunity to replace the return values before they get back into the app and wrap them 
with the, the application model class. So now we have a, essentially a version of Active Record that you can never get a data model object out of, you can only get application models out of. The byproduct is here is that from our applications perspective, there's a single object uh, interacting with a private data API that only vends objects of that same type. Functionally, it's equivalent to just making all of the AR methods private. You can probably tell by looking at, at this, it looks pretty much exactly like the private version. Uh, but it doesn't break backwards compatibility, and it's feasible for apps to move to this progressively, and it's also feasible for apps to move to this partially. You can just do it for some of your, some of your models. And I think we can all, like, it looks like Rails. It looks just like a normal Rails app. Um, this library is still in its early days, and actually to signify that, I didn't even push it to a main branch, but if you're interested in finding out more about it or reading the implementation, which is a bit more complicated than most of the other solutions, you can check out the the code that I have pushed, which is available at this link. So let me recap. Okay, okay let me recap. <laughs> we talked, <laughs> we talk, thank, you. thank you. We talked a bit about M plus ones, how they're typically solved, and a new library called Prelude that we've been using at GitHub to try to make them a bit easier to work with. Uh, and then we talked about code ownership and Rails applications. We talked about how we can make sure that we're exposing only the API that we intend to to other parts of our application and to other teams. These are both kind of united in the fact that they typically only become real meaningful problems in more evolved code bases and that we have the propensity to try to solve them with linters. In both cases, I'm proposing that we can instead solve these, is these issues with the introduction or modification of uh, APIs that are inside of Active Record to kind of push developers in the right direction, the right way to do things, uh, by convention. I hope this talk and these experiments have given you something to think about. If you don't agree with me, that's fine, but maybe they've sparked something in your mind. And before you disagree, remind yourself that I, I drank a smart water this morning, so there's a pretty good chance that I'm right. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's also inspired everyone to look at Active Record as a library that we can mold, we can evolve, uh, and we can change to suit the next generation of Rails developers. Uh, thank you to the countless people that helped give feedback on these ideas, some of whom are in this room. A lot over there, a lot over there. Um, thank you for having me speak, speak here this year, and thank you for being a part of this amazing community that I, I love. And have a great rest of your conference.